Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Fall is the perfect time to get outdoors and enjoy Minnesota's gorgeous lakes, rivers, parks, and forests. The DNR Commissioner and the Senate Environment Committee Chair grade our state's natural resources. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. The DNR's annual Fall Color Finder has been launched and signs are pointing to glorious fall color and in many areas, bountiful hunting seasons. Joining me in the studio to discuss our state's abundant natural resources is the commissioner of the DNR, Tom Landwehr. Welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, in our recent state fair program, we asked some senators what makes Minnesota so great and many responded with our state's natural resources. So where are we as a state right now? You know, um, I couldn't agree more. We are very, very fortunate in Minnesota to, to have this great slate of natural resources, public natural resources that we all get to take advantage of. And, and so I think of, when I think of the public natural resources, the things the DNR manages, it's just like state parks and trails, it's state forests, it's state public water accesses, it's fish and game, it's, it's all of those things that belong to all of us. And, you know, I would say by and large, we are in very good shape. I mean, we have uh, an abundance of good habitat. Uh, most of our populations are in good shape. We are very, very fortunate in Minnesota to have a populace that cares about natural resources. So we have a legacy amendment that's pumping money into conserving those natural resources. So, uh, you know, by and large, I think we are viewed as an island of, you know, a good uh, natural resource management, good natural resources opportunities. And I think, uh, you know, the, the population expects that, wants it, and I think have uh, shown they're going to put their money up for it. You know, I read recently about the wild rice harvesting. I know that season is wrapping up. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that season has been? You know, one of the really great things about Minnesota is that we have four distinct seasons. And so we, everybody's up at the lake during the summer, right? But uh, for me, the fall kicks off when the wild rice season starts. It's August 5th is technically the first day that you can pick wild rice, but lakes come into maturity uh, on their own at different points in time. And so I typically go out uh, about Labor Day each year. I'll go out and pick rice and had an opportunity to do that twice with some friends this year. The wild rice uh, crop was phenomenal. Uh, if, you've, if you've never seen a wild rice lake, it looks like a hayfield when it is really thick. You can hardly see the water. It's very thick. And uh, it's not uncommon to go out, uh, as my buddy and I did, and pick two or 300 pounds of rice uh, that uh, then turns into about 150 pounds of processed rice. And very good year all across the state. And so uh, really, really a, a phenomenal way to kick off the fall. And then we jump right into the small game seasons and the, and the uh, uh, pheasant season and the duck season and all those things. So it is a, it's a very exciting time of year. Uh, we would not have it if we didn't have a fall. Speaking of pheasant season, tickets to the governor's pheasant hunting opener banquet are now available. Uh, it's on October 13th and you'll be there in Marshall. The August roadside survey showed that the pheasant population is down by 26 percent. So why is that and what can be done to reverse that? You know, uh, there's a number of things that are, that are affecting pheasant populations, but I think uh, one of the uh, rewarding things for me as commissioner is back in 2014, Governor Dayton said, you know, I'm concerned about the decline of pheasants. I'm concerned about the uh, subsequent decline of pheasant hunters. Convened a group of 350 conservation agricultural interests and said, you know, what can we do about that? And the rewarding thing for me in that process was that people understood the limiting factor for pheasants is habitat. And for pheasants, it's fundamentally grass and wetlands because they need grass to nest in and feed in and they need wetlands to overwinter in. And so the, uh, when we see the populations of pheasants go up and down, uh, more recently than, than they've been going down more often than going up, uh, it's directly tied to the loss of grass on the landscape of Minnesota. Uh, not just sort of private pasture grass, but in Minnesota we were fortunate uh, 10 years ago to have two million acres of conservation reserve program land, CRP land, under the farm bill. We've lost half of that, and as we've lost half of that, you can see a direct correlation between the number of pheasants that are harvested and the amount of grass on the landscape. So it's, it's that loss of CRP. Uh, it's, sometimes it's aggravated by weather. If we get a wet spring or a bad winter, uh, that can hurt pheasant populations, but we've been fairly fortunate the last couple of years to have reasonably good winter and spring. So I think you know most of our biologists will tell you it's just a lack of habitat out there. And there are a number of things that we're doing right now to try and increase that habitat. You know, the gov governor's buffer initiative was one of those. We've got a conservation reserve enhancement program uh, going on now through the Board of Water and Soil Resources that so could have 60,000 acres. That would be to try to get that CRP land back up again? To get more grass back on the landscape, primarily on private lands, because most wildlife comes off of private lands, and we need the private landowners to partner with 
to get that uh, habitat on the ground. Over the weekend, uh, it was the waterfowl hunting opener over the very hot weekend that we had. What is the projection for the, that level of wildlife? You know, uh, one of the interesting things about ducks uh, is that they are an international species. And so most of the ducks that we shoot in Minnesota actually come from Canada or the Dakotas. So uh, when we have uh, an early warm season like this, the fact is we don't have a lot of those birds yet in Minnesota. They come through when the weather starts getting cold and the, and the winds start blowing. And so when we have you know, really record warm temperatures like we did over the weekend, the ducks that we're seeing are those ducks that were hatched and born and raised uh, on, on those ponds. And, and that is not, frankly, necessarily a lot of ducks, in, in particular for the same reasons I just mentioned with pheasants. There's not a lot of grass out there for ducks to nest in. Uh, so having said that, uh, the continental population of ducks is still pretty darn good. Uh, the state population fluctuates a little bit, depending on the waters, down a little bit. But the, uh, the harvest projections for the year are going to be good, but I suspect that over the weekend they were pretty dismal because it was 90 degrees out. Ducks don't fly when it's hot. Uh, people were hunting in shorts, you know, and <laughs> were being eaten by mosquitoes. And, and I know myself, I was out in southwest Minnesota, I just did not see many birds flying. So I suspect the opener was, was probably pretty mixed, which it always is, but probably not the best opener ever. Not ideal conditions, but if fall ends up arriving, it should improve. Exactly. Every time we get a cold front coming through from Canada, it will push birds from the Canada and the Dakotas into Minnesota. Well, archery season has begun. Firearm season begins in November. Uh, for deer hunting. Uh, there's also a special season I read for MEA break for youth uh, ages 10 to 15. So how is the deer population right now? Uh, the deer population this year is really, really good. Uh, recall a couple of years ago, I think it was 2013, 2014, we had two really severe winters back to back. In fact, uh, winter was so bad up in northern Minnesota, we had so much snow for such a long period of time, we were working with uh, private uh, landowners and private citizens to feed deer to help get them through the winter. Uh, the good news is we've had two mild winters now back to back that uh, has increased deer survival dramatically. And in addition, we reduced the number of uh, antlerless permits that we issued each of the last two years. So we had more uh, does overwintering and coming you know, into uh, breeding the next spring. So we've had two years to build that herd back up and right now it is very good. So the, the uh, number of uh, permits that we issue this year for shooting antlerless deer is up dramatically. Uh, we're hearing anecdotal reports of a lot of deer being uh, being seen, and I'm optimistic that we're going to have a pretty darn good season once the uh, once the firearm season opens. One last question: uh, In researching this segment, I discovered a program called Becoming an Outdoors Woman that was started by the DNR back in 1994 and offers a range of courses from deer hunting, archery, sled dog training, campfire building. How popular is this program, and is it helping to diminish the reported decline in outdoorsmanship? Uh, absolutely, immensely helpful. You know, the, uh, nationally, as well as in Minnesota, there's been kind of a long-term decline in people participating in outdoor recreation. Not just hunting and fishing, but camping and, you know, even uh, road, uh, mountain biking and all kinds of outdoor activities. Uh, we have been concerned about that for a long time. We at DNR and we in the con conservation community in part because when people don't participate in outdoor recreation, they don't care about the outdoors, and they, you know, we have less support for the critical programs we need. So Becoming an Outdoors Woman was launched back in, as you mentioned, the 1990s, in part because at the time we could see the demographics. You know, the, the primary participants in many of these outdoor recreations at the time were middle-aged white males. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that demographic is becoming less and less a percent of the population. And so. Uh, what better way to bring in new uh, people than bring in women, including moms and sisters and wives and, and uh, a whole demographic that uh, till now has not been uh, widely courted, if you will, for these activities. So Becoming an Outdoors Woman was established, been very, very popular. I think one of the uh, measures and metrics we can look at is that the growth in, uh, in hunter numbers uh, that we've seen over the last few years has been largely uh, driven by women uh, entering the sport. So, so we know that, uh, you know, given the opportunity, uh, women will participate. Given the opportunity, they will, they will bring the rest of the family with. And we're just uh, delighted with the success of the program. Commissioner Landwehr, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here.
A key Senate committee heard testimony on a requirement that all individuals aged 13 and older living or working in a child care setting have a fingerprint-based background study. The change was made during the 2017 legislative session to comply with the federal child care development block grant. Question I have for you on the background study requirements. One of them that I'm seeing just here is an individual at least 13 years or older who resides in a licensed family child care home or a legal non-licensed child care program. So this is in a home. Obviously, they live there. <laughs> this is their home. Uh, but 13 years old, going through a background check? There are, unfortunately, instances where there is um, uh, sexual uh, con misconduct that happens even at that age. And so it, it, trying to get to that 13 to 17, this is a home-like setting. Uh, yes, they're running a business, but it is in their home. They have other uh, family members that are there. And um, we do have, unfortunately, uh, times when there is some, uh, you know, criminal uh, uh, perpetrating by uh, a teenage family member in that household. Expanding this to our children is a violation of their privacy and their basic rights or criminal, our criminal justice system is supposed to guarantee them that they will be innocent until proven guilty and their record will remain free of accusations. I'm sorry, this is really upsetting to me. Think about dragging your 14-year-old daughter down to a police station to be fingerprinted and mugshot because she lives in the home. And if anybody thinks by fingerprinting a child it's going to keep them from being an abuser, you're wrong. If these children were already abusing, it would be in the system and the provider would not have a daycare license. This is not going to keep a child from abusing. It's going to torment these good kids. Just as you had stated earlier, we're tormenting the 99% because of the 1%. And this is my child we're talking about. I have no doubt about your good intent and your desire to protect. Um, if we run the system out of business, the good news is there'll be no one getting harmed. There'll be, if there's no more child care, home care, you know, good news. Hey, everybody's safe. Uh, but we have kids with disabilities who can't get care because you all, whoever, I don't know where, and I'm not, you're just here, you're the head, and, but this is not okay. I have heard very, very clearly from this past session as I've moved into this role in overseeing licensing, as I've tried to be more in dialogue with the providers, frustration, huge frustration, distrust. I will own that because if we don't own that and we don't acknowledge that this department, licensing in particular, needs to figure out how to uh, both embrace and have providers accept our role as regulator, <clears throat> but also as technical assistance and compliance. Many of you have raised that here today. You've raised it in different hearings this past session. They have sensitized me personally as part of my onboarding, if you will, in the last year or so about the implications for them as businesses, but also as people, as people who are very committed to children and to other people's children, which quite honestly is one of the most sacred things that we can do is to entrust our children to somebody else for a significant period of time. And I don't take that lightly as moving into this role. And at every single step, at every single bill, at every single time that we worked to come up with language, we were dead-ended every single time by DHS, every single time. We were fought against, made things more difficult. And so those words, while I appreciate them, ring very hollow right now. And much deservedly so, the folks that are here today. And this has consequences to real people and so, enough with the words, enough with the dialogue. Mm -hmm. There is bipartisan work, there is bipartisan support. And I think choosing those things that are uh, most egregious and getting some of them done is absolutely crucial and enough with, uh, with the talk because it's not right to do this to people. First of all, they are our people, they are Minnesotans. Joining me in the studio to talk about both the past and future work of the Environment and Natural Resources Committee is the chair of that committee, Senator Bill Ingebrigtsen. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. 
Generally speaking, what is your assessment of the health of the state's natural resources? I think in general the, uh, the, the, health, the health of the, the natural resources in Minnesota is in good shape. Uh, we're, we're seeing some high numbers when it comes to wild animals, when it comes to grouse, the whitetail population. Uh, it seems like maybe the ducks are coming a little further east, back east again, getting, uh, uh, getting uh, actually uh, out of that particular flyaway for some time. So I think the work that we're doing and, and the money that the uh, citizens are spending on on the environment are starting to now show. We went into it about eight, nine years of extra dollars through the legacy funds and, and whatnot. And uh, so we're seeing some good, some good things. We do have some, some issues here and there, uh, some lake issues and, and uh, whatnot. But I think over in, in general, we have, uh, I think Bud Grant called it a jewel. I mean, he's been all over the world fishing and hunting and, and he said Minnesota's a jewel. It really is when it comes to that. You mentioned some concerns with lakes and uh, this week, the Department of Natural Resources announced that it's going to appeal the ruling of Ramsey County Judge Margaret Marinan about the water levels in White Bear Lake. Uh, the department must review well permits within five miles, stop issuing new well permits, ban lawn watering should the lake fall below a certain level. Will we see a trend in Minnesota courts where lake owners um, and the Department of Natural Resources are going to the courts more often when it comes to lake levels and management of, of water? Well, well, I hope not. I, I, uh, I would like to see what happens when this gets through the court system. Uh, but the DNR seems to have found themselves in a pretty tough place. I mean, we have, we have a high population area growing around a, a lake. Uh, for goodness sakes, I think even just, you know, common thinkers know there's going to be some kind of problems with, with uh, drawing the water uh, out of the aquifer, you know, that it's going to probably affect the lake levels. But I hope we don't overreact to this. Uh, I'm going to be talking with the commissioner about that very issue. Uh, it, it not only it pertains to lakes, but are the permits going out for the irrigation systems that we have a lot of irrigators in the state of Minnesota? Uh, are they going to drag their feet when they is on, on, on issuing those because of this ruling? So there's a lot, there's a lot yet to be, uh, to be talked about, and we'll have to wait to see what the ruling says. Well, and you also mentioned uh, earlier the size of the white-tailed deer population, which brings another recent news item. Uh, the number of wolves in Minnesota is, is quite large. Courts have not allowed the federal government to take wolves off the endangered species list, but with a 25% increase in wolf numbers, should the protection be lifted and wolf hunting again be allowed in Minnesota? Definitely, I think it should be lifted. It was lifted, as you know, back in 11 and 12, I believe it was. And uh, to credit the DNR, the DNRs had a wolf plan, management plan together for a long time, waiting for the time when, this, uh, when these numbers were up as high as they were. Uh, and we actually had a very successful season for two years in a row. Uh, but yes, with this kind of a population, we have to manage the animal just like we do all other animals. And I think, uh, you know, certainly the, uh, the cattlemen are concerned about that. Uh, uh, but we still do have uh, uh, professionals that are actually trapping in some uh, some some areas where they uh, where they become very problematic, but we should be managing this animal just like we do everything else in Minnesota. Chronic waste disease has been confirmed in two Minnesota deer farms, but not in the wild. The DNR has taken steps to prevent the spread of the disease, but is there more that should be done? Uh, there's talk about more. There's talk about double fencing. Uh, uh, we've got to be careful again not to blame the wrong people here. Uh, we've got CWD in our to our neighbors to the east. Wisconsin is, has a large infection. Iowa has, has a, a fairly large group of deer that have, uh, have been found there as well. So um, uh, we talked about this just the other day uh, when, when we had our meeting about uh, they're usually the young males that actually do the transmission because of their ranging during the, the breeding season. And uh, we had a, a test site down in southeast Minnesota, which was the uh, uh, four-point restriction thing. So maybe we need to look at that. I know they lifted the lifted the uh, the hunt there. The, it did raise bigger deer. There was no question about it. And everybody wants to shoot big bucks. I, I understand that. But along with that, now it seems to maybe we do have some problems with that. Uh, so again, you got to find a balance. Um, I know the uh, the deer producers, uh, the deer, the people that raise deer are required. Every animal has to be tested. That. That, uh, that dies on their, on their site, and they've been, as far as I know, complying with that. So again, we've got to have cooler heads prevail, sit back and look at this to see what happens and see how we, uh, uh, we need to do more testing statewide, and, and I think the uh, whitetail hunters are willing to do that. 
let's turn to water for a moment. Pollution, overfishing, aquatic invasive species, which is abbreviated to AIS, uh, are all threats to the state's lakes and rivers. Are state agencies doing enough to protect this incredibly valuable resource in our state? Well, it depends upon who you talk to, I guess. Uh, uh, of course, I'm in the middle of that uh, with the, the uh, flying carp issue. Uh, we're just talking about uh, possibly uh, funding, uh, hopefully one of the last stages that will actually keep that invasive out of the state. We think we have a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, information through the scientists out of the University of Minnesota to say that we could do that if we expend some dollars. We do have this new one now called the Starry Stonewort, which is a, a very devastating, lake devastating uh, uh, invasive that, uh, and it's that a seems plant, to be. Correct? It's a plant. It's okay. actually a plant that, that doesn't have to grow off the bottom, it grows right in the water. And I actually toured the lake that, that has the, the biggest influx of that, and, and it's, it's terrible. I mean, it's, it's going to ruin the whole lake. And uh, uh, if, if the state's going to be criticized for something, it's going to be not quarantining it. Not, not trying to contain it as we should. And I know there's, there's federal dollars that, look at, that can be lost for that. Uh, if you shut the accesses down, uh, those lakes belong to everybody. I think uh, everybody agrees that they belong to everybody. But if we can contain it until we can find a way to manage it or maybe even eradicate it, why wouldn't we do that? We do have over 10,000 lakes in the state. We can shut a couple of those down. So we're, we have to seriously look at that with the DNR and, and encourage them and support them when they do that and make those tough decisions. One final question. Uh, at the meeting you just ref referenced of the Environment Committee, uh, several resort owners came forward to testify about being upset about a new three-year agreement on Mille Lacs between the DNR and tribal bands. These frequent flare-ups that we're hearing about in the news between Mille Lacs resort owners and the DNR, is it indicative of the challenges facing the state to balance tribal rights, uh, natural resources, and the business of tourism in the state. It is. It's, it's really unfortunate. I've uh, brought myself into that conversation by going over and attending a couple of those meetings. And one of which, by the way, was a closed door session. Now, I do, do not like that. Uh, you're going to hear some, a little dust up about that. Uh, uh, if, if the state employees are actually going behind closed doors with, uh, with secret meetings and then all of a sudden comes an agreement that's uh, now being called a uh, secret unknown agreement to, uh, to the general public in Minnesota. Those kinds of things can't happen. It just can't go on. So uh, I'm going to be in consultation with the uh, commissioner uh, and the governor's office on that, and I hope uh, they take a different look at that. Uh, just a bit exactly about the science. I, I certainly don't know about the science there, but there's some things that uh, that uh, both the uh, tribes and the DNR are now looking at is bringing in another expert, and that was one of the reasons I was over there, uh, a walleye expert, a walleye a fish expert from Lake Erie, and uh, he's going to evaluate what's going on there and, and come up with, uh, with his ideas as to how to try and hopefully try and fix that solution. Well, Senator Ingebrigtsen, I want to thank you so much yeah. for your time today. Thank you so much for having me, as always. An occasionally shimmering globe six feet in diameter hangs majestically above the Capitol Rotunda. The Minnesota Historical Society's Brian Pease provides the history of this century-old chandelier and explains what makes it so unique. The chandelier is one of the unique features of the state capitol. What makes it so popular? It's uh, in the center of the building. And so if you look at this big round space called the Rotunda, it's one of the things you'll notice when you walk into this space. It's directly above you, 142 feet above. And it's really kind of, you know, this rotunda is a show place of the state capitol. So the idea is you see this beautiful light fixture that has 92 light bulbs inside of it that uh, is really a spectacular part of the decoration. And that was what Cass Gilbert, the architect, had intended for this space, was to have this beautiful round space for the public and see all the beautiful architectural detail and artwork and light fixture in this case. At the time, electricity was a new technology. And the chandelier was actually called Electrolier. Can you talk more about that? Sure. Yeah, th this was really an important part of this building's design was to have wired electricity throughout the building. There was a power plant that generated all that electricity across the street from the Capitol. And you have to remember, this was a place to really proclaim and brag about Minnesota's technology and prosperity and progress. And what better place to have that than in your state capitol? So uh, at that time, you know, we, a chandelier is a, a fixture that has candles, technically, and we still call it a chandelier today. 
but at that time they were bragging that this was an electoral year because electricity was so new, so that it had a real value to really enhance the uh, understanding that technology was in a new, uh, probably a, a new thing and an important part of this uh, overall design of the capital. Is there some symbolism to its placement and the fact that we're the North Star State and it's shaped like a globe? Well, we do have the North Stars in the floor of the rotunda that represent the Minnesota, the North Star State, our state motto. If you look at the ceiling above here, uh, it has a blue panels to represent the sky. There's uh, 12 zodiac symbols and, and huge murals, nine foot murals that represent the constellations. So some people do look at that chandelier or that electrolier as a symbol of the North Star. And, and part of that is the, the importance of the state symbol as a North Star state was it's a guiding light. And so other states can follow Minnesota's lead, and that's the symbolism behind that North Star. So that could be a very appropriate way of looking at that electoral layer as a North Star. How challenging is the maintenance of it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty impressive when you look at how high it is, and that's a question people will often ask on tours is, how do you maintain that? There's over 48,000 crystal beads, 92 light bulbs inside that chandelier, and when you stand below here on the first, second, or third floor, you might be able to see there's three doors on hinges that can be lifted up. Well, you don't have to climb all the way up 140 feet to access that. It can be lowered on a winch and a chain, and then it gets accessed down on the first floor. And uh, we can go in there, clean the crystal beads, change out the light bulbs. And so it's not as complicated as a lot of people might think it is. But once again, it's part of that overall design. You put in a beautiful light fixture, you are going to have to maintain it. So you have to figure out a way to get it up and down. Is it true that it's done with the remote control now? It is, yeah. Historically, it had a, a hand-cranked winch. So you can imagine that was somebody's job to lower that down to change the light bulbs. And uh, now it's all... Uh, wireless and mechanical, so you don't have to have as much of the, uh, the manpower effort to raise and lower that chandelier. If people want to see the chandelier lit, when are the times of year that it's lit? Yeah, we have it every year. It's turned on for Statehood Day, May 11th. is our state birthday, so we became the 32nd state, May 11th, 1858. So if you want to come and be guaranteed of seeing that turned on, that will be one day. We have started the tradition of turning it on for the first day of legislative session each year, so that's something that will be uh, turned on that day. And we do, there's state events and, and public gatherings that sometimes at like Chandler will be Like the grand opening? Turned. Right, just in, in August of 2017, we had the grand reopening of the Capitol, and that chandelier was turned on each of those days. Is there a reason why the chandelier is only turned on periodically? I think part of that goes back just to the maintenance part of it, because it's a lot of work to raise and lower it. You know, it's, even though it's automatically can be done, there's still a lot of wear and tear on the chain and the fixture, so you don't, it's not something you want to do every day, bring it up and down. So uh, it really is, you know, looking at the maintenance part of it. If you turn it on every day, it's often difficult, you know, to bring it up and down to change a few light bulbs. And so the other part of that too is that it's such a, has such a long tradition of not being on every day that it's something that people look forward to seeing. So if it were on every day, it would be like, well, that's a really neat part of the building but there loses some of that specialness of being unique to the building and the size and seeing it turned on just a few times a year. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.